after 1853, uh, after Perry's visit, massive political changes happen and, and right. social changes and economic changes then follow about right. that. Why does the Tokugawa order finally crumble after two and a half centuries, and, and did cities play any role in that, in that change? Starting in the 1860s, the, or, no, I'm sorry, after 1868 into the early 1870s, the government resolves to promote mass education, seeing education of its subjects as a key to the power of a modern nation state. And they send missions gathering knowledge all around the world in the 1870s. They come home with this idea. Economic development is important. Uh, also, that the samurai privilege was an impediment to development, they decide. It's also a financial cost because mm -hmm. the samurai class was basically on welfare. I mean, mm -hmm. they were getting hereditary stipends and a lot of them weren't doing much. So the samurai were essentially expropriated. And this is interesting because the people who did the expropriation were also former samurai themselves. Mm -hmm. But they were secure themselves. And this was a great unleashing of talent or forcing the issue. Uh, Well-educated samurai had to find other things to do ambitious farmers and others could find things to do. Uh, it initially hurt the cities because the samurai had been living in the cities sure. and they, they leave, especially Edo is depopulated and actually there's a decline in Edo's population and its vitality in the 1870s. But things pick up with the um, growth of industry and then a flow of population into the cities. Japan in some sense, I mean, there, are many, there are many fascinating things about Japan's response, I mean, the first of which is maybe just that it was so successful. Mm -hmm. relative to other East Asian countries, which also tried playing technological catch-up with Europeans. Right, they, did right. it, they did it to a point in which they were you know, beating the heck out of the Russians in, in 40 years, right, or 40, right. 45 years. It, and education was surely you know, uh, hard not to think that education was a very wise and, and powerful response. But mm -hmm. they also engaged, as you mentioned, in industrial policy. And in some sense, you know, all of the East Asian industrial policies that have followed, uh, whether it's Singapore or China uh -huh. or Korea are uh -huh. in some sense descendants of that initial uh, industrial policy. Yes. But the legacy is mixed, right, of, of Japanese industrial policy. That it, it, One can argue that it did some good things, but it also wasn't, it wasn't as if every firm they invested in ended up being a winner. The factories, I think, were effective in training an initial generation of technicians on managing the enterprises. But because they had two goals, one which was to serve as a model and bring people in and show them around, and the other was to make the products, they weren't actually profitable. Mm -hmm. And the government sells them off uh, in the 1880s into private hands. And that's the origins of the Zaibatsu. Mm -hmm. And the story of Japanese economy from the Meiji Restoration through, say, the 1940s, rough, very roughly maybe has three episodes of relatively high state control in the first 15 years and then a period of relative laissez-faire from the 1880s through the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And then a tightening of state control in the 30s and, and into the 1940s. Which is associated with militarization. Yes. And, right. The Saibatsu, I guess, that first emerged when they, with the sales of the, of the early model factories, they have names like Mitsui and Mitsubishi, right? right. Uh, and, and some of them became, become largely urban firms, I guess, or, or some of them, or they remain dispersed throughout the, throughout the country. Well, they have their hand in so many activities. Right. Not all of them are I in the cities, but the corporate headquarters are and a lot of the enterprises are. The, what distinguishes the Zaibatsu, I think, from the big, con the big uh, corporations in the era of, of monopoly in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century is how dispersed they are. I mean, uh, we think about Vanderbilt or Carnegie and you think about anchoring on one industry, sure. whether it's railroads or whether it's iron and steel. Um, Mitsui was, had a hand in everything from, and so did Mitsubishi, so did um, Sumitomo, uh, so did Yasuda. Those were the four main ones. They had mines, so those were not mm, in cities. Right. They had cotton textile mills, they had paper mills did tend to be, especially the textiles in cities. They had banking, they had insurance. Those were urban-centered operations. Uh, so they were, they were doing everything um, ac across the range, including services as well as manufacturing, as well as resources.